listen to God. God can heal. Live with hope in your heart. Adore, 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 adore. Jesus, I adore. Turn with me to the Word of God in the book of Isaiah 54 and verse 2, which is our theme text. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. Father, even as we go into your word this morning, pray that you may capture our minds and our spirits, Lord, that you may bring transformation in our lives, O oh God, that this word will not just go out empty and come back empty but as you have proclaimed and decreed in your word that as it goes out it will accomplish its purpose and so lord may you touch your people at the different levels and strata that they are in at the different levels of their exposure and experience father may you come and minister to them and cause them to experience your divine enlargement because we ask with thanksgiving in jesus name now we continue with the series on the year's theme, engage, rather, enlarge your tent and strengthen your stakes. And we say it again, enlarge and now today we shall be looking at another component within that scripture, a fourth component in the theme verse, and that component is simply lengthen your cords. So far, we have established, again, bringing on board those of you that have not been with us. Number one, that we must desire enlargement. Enlargement does not just happen. There must be a desire, a deep desire for it. We must crave for enlargement in our lives. Number two, we also said that we must prepare for that enlargement. When things start happening, are you ready to... Uh, engage with God? Are you ready to receive what God is going to do in your life? So you have to prepare. And we saw that there is that which God does, but there is also that which you, as a human being, must engage with him in partnership in order to allow God's work to work and even to be produced in your life. Number three, we said that true enlargement is from God. God is a God of prosperity. God is a God of of you know advancement god is a god who wants to bless his people god is a god who wants to enrich you he wants to prosper you no wonder whenever he dealt with his children the israelites he always talked about how he was going to bless them he told moses he told abraham he told isaac about how he was going to bless them and even for us in our age and generation, I want to believe in this time here at Sitam Buruburu, God is speaking to you as an individual and is telling you, I want to bless you. I want to enlarge you. I want you to prosper. And then fourthly, which was really a deep area that we entered into, was that there are hindrances to this enlargement. As much as God wants to enlarge us, we saw that there are four hindrances. Hindrance number one we identified is fear. Fear. Secondly, we also saw that if God is going to move in our lives, if God is going to bless us, we must be ready to move out of our comfort zones. And I'm telling you, comfort zones are good places because every one of us wants to be in a place where we are not necessarily being overstretched or nothing happening that is causing us to feel stress or discomfort. We want to be in a place that we are familiar in. But yet, if you want God to bless your life, for some of you, God might have to move you out. God might have to change certain things about your environment in order to move you out of your comfort zone into his enlargement. And number three, what did we say? Man-made systems and structures. You must make sure that those man-made systems and structures do not hold you back from growing and maturing. And then lastly and fourthly, 
We talked about what? Spiritual bondage. Today we shall look at the fact that relationships enhance enlargement. We turn our attention to the ropes that hold the stretched tent into position as they are held by the stakes. These ropes hold the tent in place. They define the boundaries of the tent just as much as the strength of the stakes also holds this tent in place. But what does it look like, or rather, what does it mean to lengthen our cords? The cords are all about connection. They fix one point to another. I would propose that the cords in our lives are relationships. The Bible has much to say about the importance of positive relationships. We see this in our experience of the church too. You know, people will stay in a bad church if they have good friends there. Likewise also, they will leave a good church if they don't have good friends there. But it is not just our connection with friends and peer that counts. We need mentors too. The rope does not just stretch between two points on the ground. It stretches upward. And we need people in our life that we can look up to. We see this as Paul mentors Timothy. And elsewhere in his letters, Paul draws attention to the importance of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14 to 17, according to the New Living Translation, it says, I'm not willing, and rather, I'm not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I have become your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. That is why I have sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Paul here draws a distinction between teachers and fathers. His word suggests that just being taught the word is not enough. We need others to show us how it is done. He points to his own example and tells them, uh, rather, he, he, as he has sent Timothy and, uh, for the same purpose, to go and mentor. And if his writing alone was enough, why would he have sent someone to show them how it is done? This is not the only time we see Paul refer to imitating him in his letters. In 1 Corinthians again, chapter 11, according to the New Living Translation, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Paul urges them to imitate him. When I've heard this verse preached in the past, and I've spoken about it myself. The emphasis often is usually on us being able to live our lives in the way of uh, imitating them. But there is more power in this concept as people will not only want to believe in the person that they are imitating, but also in the virtues and in the values that they exude. But the primary application is this. The most simple application is that we should be imitators. We should copy, if you like, the example of others. I think that may prompt a little weariness among some of us. Copy someone else. Is that okay? Aren't we meant to be unique? Yes, and we are. But Paul encourages us here to follow good examples. Somebody say amen. In the New Living Translation, again, it does say like this, follow. It talks about imitating. It talks about copying. It talks about emulating and trying to be like. Copying someone who does live a life well is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that we fake it. 
I'm not saying that we should mimic everything that they do. No, no, no. What we are saying is that we should look at certain people in our lives who add value to us and who help us to go to the next level of our life. People whom God brings our way and as we interact with them and as we want to desire certain things that are in their lives, we find ourselves growing, we find ourselves maturing, we find ourselves wanting to advance in certain areas of our lives. And that is why today I want to talk about this subject of lengthening your cords by saying enhance your relationships. Enhance your relationships because your relationships are able to take you to the next level. Your relationships are also able to drop you down. Your relationships will either make you have a wider perspective about your life or your relationships can make you to be myopic and narrow-minded in the way of how you structure yourself. Somebody say amen to that. And so I want to share with us three things and I will be done. But even as I do this, I want to say that to be where I am, there is an African saying that says when you see a turtle or a tortoise on top of a wall. Know that somebody put it there. <laughs> so when you see this fellow here <laughs> doing what he's doing, somebody must have put him up there. And for me, I attribute my mentorship to great men like the Reverend Dennis White. Literally walked with him. Literally mentored me in how to plant churches. He taught me how to be consistent and devoted. He taught me how to work hard. And if there's one man I saw who worked hard was Reverend Dennis White. He taught me to be impartial. He dealt with all and sundry on the same level. The other thing that this man taught me is consistency and competence in the ministry. He was one who was astute and one who was careful about what he delivered on the pulpit. And I think I've gotten some of that from him. So you are a, a beneficiary of what Dennis White invested in my life. He taught me how to be resilient, even in the midst of criticism. As a leader, you need to rise up above this kind of criticism. Lengthen your cords by developing relationships that will expand you. Relationships matter when you want to enlarge. Don't surround yourself with small-minded people. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Somebody has said, show me your friends and I will be able to give you your character. If you have negative people around you, all they do is mama, dispute, and gossip. My friend, you are going to be a gossiper. You are going to be a murmurer. Sooner or later, you will exhibit the same bad tendencies. Some relationships will stretch you. But do not quit. <laughs> you should not defy the odds of wanting, rather, uh, 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 of desiring to, to grow and to stretch because who knows, some of the people who are in your life at such a time as this, whether as a boss or as a wife or as a husband or even the children that God has given to us or even friends that come to us, sometimes some of those guys, they come and they help us in uprooting all the bad mannerisms and all the bad things that, is, that, that we, we have, you know, in terms of our habits and behavior. It may be painful. But I'm telling you, there is a purpose why that person is in your life at such a time as this. How then do we create significant relationships? Three C's and we'll be done. Paul again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6 to 8 says something like this. As apostles of Christ, we could not have burdened you. But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her own children. 
We loved you so much, verse 8, and we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. This is Paul. This is Paul talking. Let me illustrate this by saying, elevators are very unusual places, aren't they? Especially crowded ones. You are packed like sardines, or as the Americans would put it, in Kenyan style would say, like, you know, Matatu of 58 going to Karobangi. Those days, they would make sure you are packed in and they tuck you in here, they tuck in. And then even those of you that are seated, they put some mama in between you and you wonder now, goodness me. <laughs> How will this happen? For the two hours we are going to go through the jam. You remember those days? <laughs> All right. And of course, people don't want you to touch them. Nobody's talking to the other. You can't even look at anyone. In fact, you don't look anywhere else except upwards so that you can see when your lift level is going to arrive. Have you ever noticed two people walking into an elevator talking? But once they enter the elevator, they stop talking. Strange things happen in the elevator. Now, in many respects, the elevator is a microcosm of the world today. A large, impersonal institution where anonymity, is isolation, independence are the uniform of the day. It shows us that people can be surrounded by others in a crowded setting like here at Buruburu and not experience community. We can be part of a company, a club, a church, and not feel a sense of belonging and acceptance. We can even share a carpool or an office and even a home and yet not experience significant relationship. That was not the case with Paul, the apostle. He was born in Tarsus, educated in Jerusalem, lived in Damascus, spent formative time in the desert, moved to Antioch, and that is why he talks about a, such a variety of friendships. Professionally, he ventured from Antioch on three extensive missionary campaigns, traveling from city to city. Yet, wherever he went, he established a band of people who huddled themselves together in supportive and encouraging communities. How was he able to create significant relationships? First Thessalonians, one of Paul's most personal letters, identifies some of the key components for establishing and maintaining community. Number one, he conceded that there is need for others. Concede that there is need for others. In other words, you must accept that you cannot operate alone and make any advancement in life. Just as a child needs a mother, we need each other. In another letter, Paul identified this need to belong. In 1 Corinthians 12, 20 to 22, he says, So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor again the head to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, all the more those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. This need for others is rooted deep within our souls. God planned that it be that way. That is why God said it is not good for a man to be alone in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And also in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9a, it says that two are better than one. This need of others is God-given, deeply rooted in our lives. There is one scientist by the name of Abraham a Maslow, a non-believer, he reinforced God's original design and planned through its well-known theory of the hierarchy of needs. Maslow believed that no one, that one could learn as much as by studying healthy, well-adjusted people as one could by studying those with problems. His conclusion was that each of us has various levels of need and as we satisfy one level, we move up to the next level. Maslow's 
research revealed that before we can be a person of value and become all that we were intended to become, we must have our social needs met. This is very deep. He's an unbeliever, but somehow in theology we normally say all truth is God's truth. God can also use a donkey like Balaam case to talk, all right? I remember one time when we were out there in ministry doing our open air, you know, going village to village preaching those days. Amen? There was a brother who told us how when he went to a certain place, apparently there was no, nobody who could interpret English into the mother tongue. But there was one fellow who was drunken and who was, you know, all over the place. And when they talked, he realized that he could speak some English. And so he got the drunkard to speak and translate. And people came forward and they gave their lives to the Lord. Others were slain in the spirit. God moved regardless of whether it was in the mouth of a drunkard or not. At the end of it, of course, he sorted out the man. <laughs> but God can use anything. Even your child. Sometimes they speak to you as a parent and you wonder, what are this child saying? But they are talking some virtue in your life. So don't look at them and say, nothing good can come from them. No wonder Paul tells Timothy, let nobody look down on you because you are young. You still have something that God can do in your life. Hallelujah, somebody. This need for others, as we said, is God-given. We must have relationships. Number three. Number two, the next C is cultivate deep relationships, according to verse 8. Do not take relationships lightly. To survive in a cold and a cruel world requires deep relationships. But those relationships do not just happen. They require effort. You must make effort. You, those people who are easily able to give up on relationships, they never make it in life. I'm telling you, you must fight. You must hang in there. You must be willing to, you know, just go an extra mile sometimes in some of these relationships if they are ever going to mature and become of substance. The truth was that the secrets of Paul's establishment of supportive relationships was that we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel but also our lives because you became so dear to us. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. Found in these verses are three words which are very important as we talk about the basis of developing relationships which will pass the test. Number one is care. Everybody wants somebody caring about them. And that's where we draw our significance from. If there's nobody caring about you, my friend, you are headed to doom. You always look out. And that's why he says, as a nursing mother nurtures her own child, care. Remember, people don't care so much how much you know until they know how much you do what? You care. The second one is share. We were pleased to share with you. <laughs> Again, about significant relationships, people want something they can share. Something that can make them identify with you. And if there is nothing to identify with you, if you're just there to use somebody and not to also pour yourself in them, that relationship will not go very far. It will, it will wither. There must be a sharing. There must be a give and take kind of a situation. And the same thing even to our relationship with God. As much as God has blessed us, as much as God is willing to answer our prayers, what are we doing in reciprocation? In loving him and serving him. Another word there is dear. Because you became dear to us. Verse 8 there. Paul loved these people genuinely. And when we love others, we treat them as they ought to be treated. We communicate love to them. We show them that we are there for them with our handshake, with, with, with our hug, with our sharing. You know, with gifts of kindness. 
And number three and lastly, commit to authenticity. Commit to authenticity. It is not enough to admit that we need each other or say, oh, how few friends we have could be nice. We must commit ourselves to getting beneath the surface talk and become interested and accountable to each other. Authenticity occurs when the masks are removed and conversations go deep and hearts become vulnerable to one another. Lives are shared and accountability is invited. Tenderness flows. Believers in the body of Christ need to become brothers and sisters in the same way. Assimilation is becoming absorbed in the lives of others as we actively participate in their lives, as we relate with them, as we share with them, as we care for them. The Apostle Paul describes assimilation in five words. We imparted our life, our own lives. We imparted our own lives. That is what assimilation is all about. Paul did not erect barriers. He was not aloof. He opened his life to others. A Ruben Gunnatsi said of this same area of assimilation, we can't simply cheer up people and give them, our, rather, it says like this, we can't simply cheer people on and give them our best wishes. We have to make room for them in our lives. When we make room for others in our lives, the walls of indifference, apathy, come down. When we make room for others, we discover the best of them and of them also in us. As I conclude, people need each other. We need to take off our masks and admit our need for each other. Cultivate relationships. Strive for authenticity. It is worth noting, according to Martin Barber, the words that sin is our failure to grant another his pleasure, or rather his plea for community. May we never be guilty of committing that sin as we build authentic relationships. This is the year, and I pray that God will help you endeavor to enlarge your tent by lengthening your cords through establishing strategic partnerships and networks enlarge your spiritual tent by connecting yourself to somebody who can be a prayer partner who can be a confidant and who can be an accountability partner what i'm saying is this don't be a lone ranger don't be what there's a saying that says that if you want to go where far you walk alone eh? but if you want to go faster all right it's the other way around if you want to go faster you walk alone but if you want to go far you have to have company with you shall we stand as we go to the lord in prayer and as we conclude hallelujah